I've been waiting for this all day. I get to introduce Dr. Meredith Kerpius. Meredith Kerpius has over 20 years of experience working on technical air quality issues. Originally from New York, Meredith has a Bachelor of Science degree from Cornell in Natural Resources where she first started air quality monitoring. She then earned a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in Environmental Science. See, Meredith, I can read. <laughs> Policy and Management where she was both a Berkeley Fellow and a National Science Foundation Fellow. Pretty impressive. Um, while pursuing her PhD, she worked with a research team to set up and run a remote air monitoring field station in the Sierra Nevada mountains. The focus of her re research was fate and transport of ozone in the Sierra Nevada, but most of her time was spent working in the field with air monitoring instruments. After doing a postdoc at Oregon State University where she managed more remote air monitoring field sites, this time in the Cascades, Meredith joined the Environmental Protection Agency in San Francisco. Evidently, if you have mountains nearby, Meredith will stop by and do some measurements for you. Most of her time at the EPA has been with the air monitoring team as the team's lead. She has worked on air quality issues with almost every air monitoring agency in California. Since July, Meredith has assumed management of the Air Quality Analysis Office, which includes air monitoring, emissions inventory, modeling, GIS, and data management. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kerpius. That was an impressive demonstration of restraint, Eric. <laughs> I know you can read. My, the thing I don't know is whether you can hold back the insults, but there, there it is. OK. I've learned something today. Uh, Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, air monitoring network plans for the next couple of minutes. And um, most of you don't actually put together a network plan, most of you in this room. Um, there's often just one person in an agency who puts them together. So most of you are probably thinking, oh good, I made it through Eric's presentation, now I really need a, to take a nap. Um, and as a matter of fact, Chris Landon said that this would be a good section for beers and blankets, as he put it. So, <laughs> so if we hear snoring from that side of the room, we know what's going on. Um, but in addition to giving some general background on air monitoring network plans, uh, I'm hoping to impress upon you that the network plan is a synthesis document of your monitoring operations. Um, and to have a solid network plan really requires input from all facets of the, the monitoring program, including the data analysts, uh, analyzers, including also the auditors, and especially the site operators. Um, so I, I get the sense that the site operators don't always um, see that they have a really strong role in the monitoring network plan, and, and I'm hoping to convince you otherwise in this presentation. Okay, so we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to define the network plan for you, give you a little bit of history, uh, provide some information on challenges. Actually, I've moved the challenges towards the end. Um, we're going to talk about what goes into a, a network plan, and, and you've seen a lot of this information, so some of it I'm going to breeze through. Um, talk a little bit about the current process um, for submittal and review and then uh, finish with the impacts on regulatory actions, kind of why do we actually care about the network plan. Okay, so what is an annual monitoring network plan or monitoring annual network plan? And you'll see the shorthand, just the, the ANP um, throughout the presentation. So that's just referencing the annual network plan. Okay, this is the only thing I'm actually gonna read, but I want you to actually know what the CFR says about it. It's 40 CFR 5810. And as Chris mentioned earlier, part 58 is the Bible uh, for air monitoring. So um, this is a really critical, critical part of the CFR. So it says, the plan shall include a statement of purpose for each monitor and evidence that siting and operation of each monitor meets the requirements of appendices A, C, D, and E of this part where applicable. So that's a lot of information to go in a plan and to consider that you have to provide evidence of meeting all of these different requirements, um, it's a hefty task. Um, and that's what dictates what goes into the monitoring um, annual network plan. Uh, in addition to what Part 58 says about um, you know, what we're supposed to include in the network plan, it's also specific about the types of instruments that we are addressing in the network plan. So specifically, we're supposed to include the regulatory uh, instruments, those are the FRM and the FEM instruments, um, at SLAMs, NCOR, STN, CSN sites, 
state speciation, uh, SPM, and PAM sites. So if you have a, a special purpose, a toxic site, it does not have to be included in your network plan, although a lot of agencies do choose to put that information into the network plan. But so it's, it is still the scope of the network plan is limited to regulatory instruments at what we consider regulatory types of sites. Um, I was once asked why we call it a network plan since it's not really a planning document. It's really a documentation kind of thing. So, um, you know, maybe it's a misnomer, but it does actually look back at what you've already been doing with a little bit of what you plan to do. So um, just, you know, to avoid any confusion, um, it is for documentation of what your network has been rather than to plan out the future. Okay, so a little history. Um, there, there have been network plans around for a long time, but in 2006, there was a big overhaul of the monitoring regulations in the CFR. And as part of that overhaul, uh, EPA beefed up the, the monitoring um, network plan section um, and required network plans from agencies who do monitoring, regulatory monitoring. Um, given that there weren't very many specifics in the CFR about you know, how to put these together, uh, in Region 9, we put together a guidance document in 2007 um, and that was in advance of when the first plans were due, which was July 2007. Um, so we, we kind of scooted along for a couple years with that. Things were kind of going okay. We were approving plans. Um, and then in 2011, good old South Coast, um, we got sued on approval of the South Coast Annual Network Plan. And that really changed the whole scheme of how we were doing network plans. Um, so there's a lot more scrutiny what happened was we were sued on approving a particular portion, and, and Debbie mentioned it this morning. It was about an, uh, having near road monitors. Um, but the, the lawyers who um, had been working on the case came back to us and said, well, you've been approving plans, but you have no documentation on the basis of your approval. So we really need to, it, this is a big, huge legal vulnerability. You're approving plans with no basis. So th that changed the whole process. Um, we went through, we pulled out all the different requirements that, you know, this evidence of ACD&E, appendices ACD&E, pulled them all out, compiled them, and put together a comprehensive list of what would need to go in the network plan based on what the CFR is kind of suggesting. Um, it's not very clear, but that's what the lawyers are indicating it's suggesting. So there's a new process, um, 2012, and 2013 network plans were reviewed under this new process. And, you know, I think it's been a big learning curve for all of us, anyone who's been involved in this. Um, you know, and as Mark kind of mentioned, uh, we've been asking for new things. And it's, it has, it's been a learning process. We get some stuff one year, and then we say, okay, next year we want you to also include this, this, and this. And we're aiming towards um, everyone having complete network plans, at which time we're hoping, um, similar to what Mike Miguel had just mentioned, it shouldn't be too much of a burden to be updating them every year once we have them all, you know, complete and where we need to be. Okay, so that's, that's the history of how we got to where we are. Um, so I'm going to spend most of the time on this presentation talking about what goes into the network plan. Um, and again, back to that CFR citation, it's the general parts of Part 58, uh, which you've heard about, um, appendix, appendices A, C, D, and E. And I'm going to talk a little bit um, about each of these in some detail. Um, actually, before I, before I go on, um, you know, this is what goes into the network plan. So there's another question of how does the stuff get into the network plan? And, you know, there's a network plan preparer who assembles hundreds of bits and pieces of information and puts them in detailed site report tables and then puts some nice text describing minimum monitoring requirements and trends and probably a lovely cover on it all, right? That there's one person typically who's doing that. But that person is not, doesn't have all of that information in his or her head. That person has to get that information from someplace. And so this is really where I want to compel you all who are working, you know, on the ground, either as auditors, either as site operators, um, or even as a local district who gives information to ARB to go into their plan. The more you can co communicate and coordinate with the person doing the network plan, the more accurate and the better that plan is going to be. So, you know, it's not just what goes into the network plan, but
but how it gets there is, is a really critical part of this whole process. Okay, so I'm gonna start with part 58. Um, and Eric covered a lot of what's in part 58, so I'm just gonna give some examples of what you'll see. So there's sampling schedules. Um, we know that you know, sampling schedules can change. Sometimes what happens is uh, a monitoring manager and a site operator will talk about changing the sampling schedule and the network plan pro person isn't aware of that change. The network plan gets uh, prepared and it reflects an older sampling schedule. So um, that's something we EDPA check for, but that's a, an example where the site operator will really have the most current information um, on what the true sampling schedule is. Um, site changes is another thing that goes into the network plan. So often sites have to move, as we just heard. Sometimes it's even just 100 feet or so. But nonetheless, um, again, the site operator is gonna know when did the move happen, what's the day that, that it all started, did all the instruments move at the same time, what are the probe heights. So again, that on the ground information is critical to go into the network plan once a site change happens. Appendix A, as you've heard, is the QA, QC section, and it's a, it's a rather dense and detailed part of the CFR. Um, so some of the things that you'll find in Appendix A include the audit stuff. Um, here's a little schematic of a through the probe audit um, that ARB has. Um, and the auditors clearly are gonna have important information on the dates of the audits and how many were done in a year, which is something that needs to go into the network plan. Um, the site operators also will have that kind of information in their log books. Um, co-location, I mean, it seems like it would be very obvious which sites are co-located, but things get moved around, um, and the site operator might be the one who's the only one who knows what's the distance of those two co-located probes. Again, as Eric mentioned, you might get a call, hey, go out and measure the distance between those two probes, right? And, and that's why, because that kind of information needs to go in the network plan. And who knows it? It's the site operator. Uh, Appendix C is, I will say, a portion that probably most people in this room don't really have to pay attention to with regards to the network plan. Um, it deals with instrumentation, and one of the things is the PM 2.5 FEM waivers. That's where if an instrument like a continuous uh, BAM 1020, that's an FEM, is not agreeing well with an FRM, an agency can seek um, a waiver so that those data are not considered regulatory. Um, so there's some fancy kinds of figures that get put together to show whether it's meet, whether how well it's agreeing with the, the FRM or not. Um, so in terms of putting that information together, that's not a huge role for a site operator or an auditor, but probably for someone who analyzes the data. Um, the site operator, however, will have an important role in managing operational issues to help the data quality improve um, with the hopes of bringing the instrument in line with what the FRM is. So, but in terms of network plan, if you're a site operator, auditor, this probably isn't gonna be where you're gonna get phone calls. Appendix D is the minimum monitoring requirements. All right, we won't belabor this because Eric gave us uh, quite a bit of information on all of this. Suffice it to say, this is really the data analyzers are gonna be contributing this information. I don't think really anyone in the site is gonna get a phone call asking about minimum monitoring requirements. And last but not least is the siting. Um, this really is something the site operators will know better than anybody. Um, the auditors on occasion will be out of the site and seeing the sites, but really nobody knows a site like the operator. Um, so I'm gonna, and I'm gonna talk about a couple different aspects of Appendix E. Um, there's trees. We heard about you know, tr not siting within 10 meters of a, of a drip line of a tree. Um, this is a National Park Service site. Um, I expect none of you here would ever set up a site like this. So <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's clearly not meeting requirements. It's surrounded by trees. Um, there's probably not even much that can be done about this particular site. But that's, I think that's not the case you're gonna be dealing with. More often what's gonna happen is for you, you're gonna be um, dealing with a site where you set up your site 20 years ago. It was a lovely site, no trees around. And then the property owner or a, a friendly neighbor decides to plant a tree. And they plant it right next to your, where your probe is, right next to your trailer. 
And at first, you don't even really see that the tree is there. It's on the far side of the trailer. You know, it's below the trailer. It's, it's you know, who cares about that, that silly little shrub that's down there, right? But sure enough, that tree's going to grow and grow and grow, and soon you're going to have a situation like you see in the figure on the, on the screen where this tree has grown above and much higher than where the, the uh, probe is, and now it's a problem. This whole site had to be moved because the property owner would not remove the trees, they wouldn't trim the trees. There were a couple of these that were there. Um, so that's, that kind of information needs to go in the network plan um, so that we can all start working towards resolution. Um, and again, it's really the, the site operator who's at the site, who sees the tree growing, who's the kind of front line of dealing with that kind of stuff. Um, then there's obstructions. Now clearly an obstruction is not going to just grow like a tree, but um, they can, they can come just as unexpectedly. Uh, a property owner can decide it's going to plop down a big giant trailer right next to you where your probes are, or maybe put on a second story. You know, there's lots of things that can happen since most of you don't own your own sites. You lease them and someone else is actually dealing with the property. So um, this is another thing the site operator is going to have the on-the-ground knowledge um, and the ability to tell, um, tell the monitoring folks, the ma manager, and others who can help deal with the situation, and also get it into the network plan. Distance to roadways, um, you saw some of the information that Eric presented about um, that certain, for certain pollutants, uh, the probe has to be um, a certain distance from um, a road, depending on how busy the road is. So I'm just showing ozone. Um, the point is not to really spend too much time on the figure, but just recognize that for ozone, for example, there, you can't be too close to a road. Um, in some cases, we want to put monitoring sites near roads. These are near road sites um, for PM2.5 and NO2 and CO. That's, that's what we're trying to do. But if we were to put an ozone monitor where you see these probes um, up on the screen, we would not be able to use the ozone data as a regulatory monitor, um, nor should it go into the minimum monitoring requirements to fulfill those. Um, it may be important for research um, purposes, but it wouldn't be a regulatory monitor. Um, so, you know, most of you are going to know in advance whether your ozone monitors at a near road site are regulatory or not. But what you may not know is a situation more like this one where a monitor was put up just on a building in a neighborhood, and over the years the building, uh, the road gets busier and busier and busier, and next thing you know your traffic count is um, high enough where you're not far enough from, from your road anymore. So that's something, again, that the, the site operator is going to have on the ground knowledge um, and is the one who can be telling the, the network plan person, okay, I've seen more traffic over the years. We should check the traffic count um, at this site again. Um, and I think this is the last one for siting on probe height. Um, Eric mentioned this. Things change. Probes move. Um, we heard earlier about the, you know, the probe that got stuck down in the tubing and you know, so it's the site operators who are seeing this kind of stuff and know when probe heights change. Um, that needs to go into the network plan. And again, you know, if your network plan preparer calls you and says, can you double check that probe height? You know, that's what they're after. They're just trying to put it into the network plan, double check things. Um, since we're all in California, I don't think we always recognize what a unique kind of situation we have. Um, earlier you saw that Gwen showed us the state of Florida and what their PQAO and local districts look like. Um, they have a total of six local agencies and one state agency to manage. And that's, from what I understand, the most complicated state outside of California. Here we have CARB plus 21 agencies, all who monitor. And putting all of that together is very complicated, and I think we kind of take it for granted. That's just how it's structured. But let me just tell you that it adds immense complication that we all kind of have to together get through. Um, not all agencies of those, you know, CARB plus 21 districts put in network plans. We get 14 different ones. Um, and so there's, you know, not a lot of, we try to not have overlap. Um, so for example, an agency, uh, Let's just take uh, San Luis Obispo County. Um, ARB and San Luis Obispo um, AP County, APCD, both operate districts, operate, sorry, sites in that district. 
And um, who should do the network plan? Is it ARB? Is it the district? Um, what we've, what, what's kind of emerged is that in that case, the district does the network plan, but they have to include information on the ARB sites. They don't operate the sites. They don't, they're not around them. You know, so it's a, it's a complicated thing to get information um, on sites that you don't operate. But that's just kind of how this is all developed and how we've kind of learned to live with it. Um, there's even, there, there are some counties that have three different agencies all kind of working together. And assembling all that information is, is really complicated. So I just want to acknowledge that it's, it's not this difficult everywhere else. This is a unique challenge that we have. And you know, I think it's, it's really impressive how much we all work together to try to make this all happen. Um, there are also, and Eric mentioned this, there's you know, different, different kinds of requirements that apply at different levels. Um, there are local requirements, which a local agency would most likely be able to handle quite fine. But then there are MSA, as Eric mentioned, those are the CBA, MSA kinds of requirements, like minimum monitoring requirements. And one local district may have only part of an MSA and may have to work with another local district or ARB to figure out if they're meeting requirements for, for that MSA. Then there are state level requirements. And again, what does that local district put in its network plan about meeting those state level requirements? Um, and finally, PQAO requirements like co-location. So assembling all of this and putting together something for the state of California that covers every monitor and every site um, is really a, an impressive feat. Um, the last little part of this before the, before the uh, you know, what happens if this goes wrong <laughs> um, is about the process. Um, so there's a submittal process. You all work together. You put together your network plans. Um, the network plans are due to um, EPA by July 1st of each year. Um, there's a public inspection comment period that's required. That means that those network plans have to be done by May 31st, right? So that's, that's what, two or three days from now. So, you know, this is really the crunch time for network plans. Um, and considering what we just talked about with all the need for coordination, you know, let me, so there's the timing part. Um, right, it's enough to make you feel like the Mad Hatter when you're putting all of this together and, and it's, it's complicated. So um, I really just want to make a pitch for reaching out, site operators reaching out, network planners reaching out, local districts reaching out, ARB reaching out. I mean, you all need to be coordinating all of these bits and pieces of information. Um, and it's complicated, but it's, it's an important process and it's something we all need to do together. So what do we do when we get the plan? Um, we have a detailed checklist that those of you who have prepared plans um, have seen. It's got uh, about 100 different um, requirements that we check. Some we check for every single monitor that gets operated. Um, we look to see if the information is there, and we look to see whether it's accurate. Um, so our response uh, can either be we, we would approve um, something that is complete and meets the requirements. If you provide something that's either not complete or doesn't meet a requirement, our typical response is that we just simply don't act on it. We note it in the network plan, hey, this wasn't there, or hey, uh, we have other information that the tree is actually now grown to be seven meters. Um, can you go double check it and correct it for next year's plan? So we will give you the information that we have. Um, this is often our most detailed portion of our network plan reviews, and I, I just want to let those of you know who, who deal with the network plans that this is not an attempt on our part to be critical. This is an attempt to give you information, as much information and as detailed, in order to help you move your process forward. So we want to work through this process with you um, collaboratively. So, you know, the, the more information we give you, the more we're trying to reach out rather than trying to criticize. Um, in very rare cases, if there are minimum monitoring requirements, um, we would disapprove that portion of the network plan. Uh, if there are problems, we recommend that you just address them in next year's plan. So your plan does not have to be perfect. We don't expect it to be perfect. We expect you to submit it with the most information that you have. We'll point out where we need to continue to work on things, and then it comes back in next year's plan. There is the option, just because people have asked, there is the option if you wanted to redo your plan, like you get, you know, you get a letter in the fall that says you're missing this, this, and this, and you say, well, I'd really like to have 
my network plan fully approved, and if I just give you back X, Y, and Z, you can fully approve it. That option exists. No one has ever used it. People mostly say, yes, I'll just correct it in next year's plan, and we'll move on from there. Okay, so I feel like this is the doom and gloom section of, like, what happens if there are deficiencies. And I think we've heard a lot about the impact on regulatory data. So I really don't want to get – I don't want to really cover all this stuff again. Um, and plus, I think the next uh, presenter will give us a little bit more of this, the impacts. Um, but what I do want to say, it kind of occurred to me that, you know, all this talk about what happens if you – have a monitoring site that's not meeting requirements, um, you know, that, that we may not be able to use the data or all these things. Um, you know, I can imagine a school of thought where you might think, well, maybe I should just leave that out of my network plan and just fix it, and then, and then it, won't be in the, it won't be under public scrutiny. Um, so I, I, I just want to encourage that um, that's, that's probably not going to solve um, the issue. And, you know, I really think about this as the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. And if there are data challenges or monitoring challenges, it's much better for EPA to know about them going into some sort of regulatory action than for them to come out later. So really the more information you can put into your plan, even if you know it's not meeting a requirement, the quicker we can work together to fix the issues, or just even if, even if they're not fixable that year or even the next year, the more we can be prepared to manage that situation if we need to do a regulatory action. So I want you to not be shy about putting information in your network plan, even if you know it's not meeting a requirement, because that's how we make progress. So rather than doom and gloom, I just wanted to mention that. Um, and that's it. Any questions? Hi, that was very uh, informative. Um, Rob Schusterich with the Bay Area Air Quality. You mentioned challenges, um, audits. Who, des who decides in this new scheme of PQAOs the frequency and the re whose responsibility? Is that laid out in the network plan also, the um, audit frequency? Um, well, I know the, the EPA does TSA audits. How often do they do that? The ARB audits us. We have in-house audits. Um, ARB, somebody mentioned free lunch, you know, earlier. They, those uh, small districts get audited once probably, or they have one auditor. Um, the ARB audits them, and, you know, so right. I'm just want to, like, is that laid out in the network plan, the frequency and the uh, amount of audits and who does them or what? Well, you know, for, for those agencies that are their own PQAOs within the state of California, you're more following what's in the, the CFR about the number of audits, plus ARB d does some of your annual audits. And, you know, there's a kind of a complicated way that the, the NPAP, which is the federal audits and the PEP audits, get done. But for, for most agencies who are within the ARB PQAO, um, that should be specified in the roles and responsibilities document. Um, I mean, that's the ideal way, place that that should, that should be outlined. Right. So, I mean, Mike, is that, I mean, is that, that's my understanding of the kind of information that's in the roles and responsibilities document is who's doing the audits and what frequency. The frequency of audits are dictated in regulation. So we're required to visit the sites in our PQAO once a year and not at every gaseous pollutant. Um, for the particulate samplers, they have to be audited twice a year. Okay, so what about uh, a district that is its own PQAO? The district that it's is, right, it, that district is required to meet that same frequency. However, what ARB does is we visit the three PQAOs for a couple of purposes. It's not required, but because ARB uses the information um, uh, on a statewide basis, they like to see the ARB audit team visit those sites. And we typically try to schedule a visit to every site in your agency once every five years. Well, it's not an audit, it's a visit. Well, no, well, hold on. Let me, let me clarify. So even though I'm ARB sorry. is not required to go to, to visit your P, the, the three PQAOs, uh -huh. um, those, those visits 
do typically get used to count, count towards the requirement of the annual audit. So, so even though you could at, at a point say, you know what, we're going to scale back and then the local district, Bay Area, South Coast, San Diego would be required to implement their own audit program um, to make up for that one audit that, that ARB That's is correct. doing. That, that's correct. Yeah, okay, okay. I just, I don't have a problem with being audited. That seems like I'm audited a lot. I mean, you know. What, what site's yours? Uh, Sam, just. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, be, they'll, be, they'll be coming extra. <laughs> Hi, Meredith. Got a clarifying question for you regarding minimum, minimum monitor requirement for ozone. Um, as you show on one of your slides, I think it's slide nine, that for ozone, only slams monitor are counted. And in the right. past, we've been only counting slams monitor for MMR purposes. However, we were instructed that SPM monitors should also be included with the MMR count. And I just want to clarify with EPA saying, are we following the regulation, just counting slams, or are we, or are we following what EPA wants and counts both slams and SPM? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so the, the role that SPMs play is somewhat complicated. Um, it's, there are some clear cases where an SPM that's not meeting a regulatory requirement would clearly not count towards your minimum monitoring requirements. Um, and we would typically like to see that all monitors that are used to, to count towards minimum monitors would be SLAMs. Um, we do, however, consider some SPMs as required because they're needed for regulatory decisions. Um, and so we would encourage anyone who has an SPM, that's an, say an ozone monitor that is meeting minimum requirements, that should be, it should be converted to a SLAMs. And um, this is just a statement. I mean, as a site operator, you, you, you have many duties. You go out there and you have worry about doing calibrations and site maintenance, et cetera. It, I just wonder how many site operators will know the appendices A, C, D, and E in the back of their mind saying that, hey, this monitor is too close to the railway now. I can't imagine that, you know, I can't imagine that site operators are going to have to now not, not just worry about the flow checks and site maintenance, but now they have to uh, memorize that this monitor is too close to the roadway and therefore needs to be uh, brought up with my management yeah, or no, trees. I can appreciate close. that. There's a lot of other stuff going on. You have to remember, you know, all, all the flow checks and all the maintenance stuff. Um, but. There could be a system where the person who prepares the network plan could provide something to the site operators once or twice a year that says, hey, have there been any changes in trees or roads? Or, I mean, there's, there's a fairly short list in the end of things that the site operators would need to contribute. Um, and especially if the auditors are also looking for some of these things as well. Um, I, I was just going to say the same thing. Th those items that are key, um, our audit team has what we do a site survey and this distance to obstacles, distance to tree drip line, that sort of thing. So those items, and, and it's, a, it's a short list. Yeah, I agree with you, Fang. It's impossible to you'd get inundated with all those documents. But um, on the audit reports that we have is, is, are the key elements that we're looking at when we evaluate all of the siting. So hopefully. Yeah, but we go over those site reports with, with each of the operators. So, you know, I, I hate to cut this off, but um, we're running short of time. 